Um, so, well, uh, uh, organizing a festival is, as you know, a huge challenge. So, we wanted to thank uh, everyone, especially the consortium, because, as you know and you heard, this is part of the Creatures Project, a three years project of combining research with artistic practices. But apart from all the partners that you can see here, we wanted to specifically name some people. So I'm going to start by, by thanking uh, uh, Christina and uh, Karen from the RMIT Europe team because they have been working so hard to make this possible. So thank you so much. And I ask for an applause for both of them. Also, we have more people from RMIT Europe. Uh, Gemma has been working so hard, Ines, uh, and also Jordi. Uh, Tania from uh, um, is a, this, a, a Finnish graphic designer who has been helping us to put all these creatures that you see as the logo. And uh, of course, Yes, uh, Choi. It has been an amazing journey for us uh, at Sembos 98 to work with RMIT Europe, but especially with you. So thank you so much for everything you have done. We, we are learning a lot, and this is so special to be here in Sevilla. And if you allow me, I'm going to say something in Spanish now. Um, hacer esto en Sevilla es muy importante para el proyecto de Critters, porque queríamos, después de dos años y medio de pandemia y de múltiples videollamadas, que ha sido la principal herramienta de trabajo que hemos tenido, poder vernos, poder tocarnos y poder estar en un lugar como este, que es un lugar que, como sabéis, y aunque suene obvio decirlo, es un lugar donde se producía guerra para poder, digamos, imaginar futuros más sostenibles, pero también más pacíficos, más diversos, más inclusivos, eh, más feministas y más antirracistas. Así que, nada, desde Cemos 98, Eh, es un placer poder acoger este proyecto y nuestra pequeña contribución es lo que siempre hacemos, que es generar eh, vínculos entre personas de distintos perfiles y distintos ámbitos. Nos lo estamos pasando muy bien, estamos muy cansadas, pero esperamos que estos tres días, que tienen mañanas y tardes, mañanas en Santa Clara y las tardes aquí en Artillería, disfrutéis de la variedad de trabajos que hay y de, y de, y de todo el trabajo que se ha puesto para, digamos, mostrarlo y enseñarlo a la ciudadanía, que es lo, lo más importante. Okay, and I'd also like to thank people who have been putting in so much love and work into this festival. So, Marqueta from Alta University, Thibault, our creative producer, uh, Malena, Noelia, Alethea, Danny, Julio, Maria, who's translating this right now, Benito, Pedro, and of course, Felipe. Thank you so much but also uh, the entire Zemos 98 crew. And their cultural mediation work has been playing such an important role in eco-social and creative transformation in Sevilla. And it, I cannot overstate this, so uh, thank you uh, so much for making this happen. I don't normally bring things to read out, but I was so excited and nervous that Alexandra was giving a keynote, so I had to write it out. I'm just going to read it out also. So please let me introduce uh, Alexandra Pirici, who is an artist and choreographer who boldly, incessantly, and beautifully questions, especially those that are often considered concrete or set in stone, literally or not. Uh, they continue to open up, for example, Richard Serra's Tilted Arc, but also Connor's Ninth Fort, in a way that they describe as enlivening, involving moving human bodies. And drawing our attention to that everything can in fact be questioned, engaged with, uh, but also how it's all in constant flux. And Pirich's beautiful entanglements uh, with a wide range of subjects from such monuments, memories, linear histories to artificial intelligence, resonate deeply and inspire creatures' commitment and desire to create new spaces for relations towards eco-social transformation through creative practice. Um, in the ongoing performative action, Encyclopedia of Relations, shown as part of uh, this year's Venice Biennale, 
Pierici uh, continues this complex and interconnected questioning by directly engaging with embodied relations and transformation as understood uh, in different fields like botany and broadly biology as well. They are one of the artists I personally find most exhilarating and so happy and feeling so lucky to have them here with us today. Please welcome Alexandra Pirici. Thank you very much, dear Jazz, for such a wonderful, humbling introduction. And uh, yeah, good evening and thank you, a big thank you to the organizers for extending the invitation and also for working to create this context. Um, and of course, thank you very much for being in the audience today. Um, I will try to be as brief and as straight to the point as possible. So I'm an artist uh, with a background in dance and choreography, but I've worked mostly in the visual arts for over a decade. Um, nevertheless, I've been working with performance, so with live works, with living bodies, in exhibition spaces, in public space also. Um, and I have been invited to speak on the topic of entanglements and eco-social transformation. And I will try to do so from my perspective as an artist and as straight to the point as possible, while also allowing myself to maybe not digress, but to expand or wander around in the pro process, as both, I think, being an artist and the topics um, might allow that. And I want to start from the concept of entanglement. And maybe I can also use the slideshow that I've prepared. So I want to start from this concept of entanglement. And besides the many ways in which it is also used in the art world, as I have the feeling it appears uh, quite, uh, quite often now uh, in, in when we speak about the arts and in different exhibition contexts and discourses. Uh, there's a welcome need uh, to acknowledge and describe the many ways in which we are connected and depend on each other in both concrete and metaphorical ways. But I actually want to touch upon its use in physics also, and more specifically in quantum physics. And I would like to do this by mentioning my entry point into the matter, into this vast matter of quantum entanglement, which again, I don't claim to be familiar with. Uh, it's a whole world and it's quite confusing and very counterintuitive, um, but very, also very important in many ways. And I just want to mention my, 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 my gateway into the subject, my entry point which is a materialist philosophy of Karen Barad. Karen Barad is a feminist philosopher, physicist, who draws on quantum physics for their theory of agential realism. And this agential realism is a, what she calls, what they call an onto-epistemology. So it's both a theory of knowing, of what we can know, how we know the world, and uh, a theory of being, of how we are and how things are actually in the world. And it basically challenges individualist metaphysics. So the idea somehow that the world is made of well dis separated and distinct elements that have uh, predetermined properties and we, we discover these distinct elements which are what they are. So her theory of agential realism challenges this kind of individualist metaphysics and says that phenomena as in intra-acting agencies are the very unit of reality. Where intra-acting agencies, and here she, she really insists upon this difference between intra-acting and inter-acting, uh, are inseparable. So rather than something uh, that pre-existing individuals have, they are relationships through which individuals emerge. So it's quite a um, strong, important dis uh, difference. And I will quote, quote from their book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning. 
And the, the quote that you, you see is from that book also. Um, but I will start with, a, with a, a different passage. The neologism intra-action signifies the mutual constitution of entangled agencies. That is, in contrast to the usual interaction, which assumes that there are separate individual agencies that precede their interaction, the notion of intra-action recognizes that distinct agencies do not precede, but rather emerge through their intra-action. It is important to note that the distinct agencies are only distinct in a relational, not an absolute sense. That is, agencies are only distinct in relation to their mutual entanglement. They don't exist as individual elements. Sorry for this introduction that uh, draws a lot on philosophy, but I, I hope it will be worth it. <laughs> so if you bear with me a little bit longer. Um, and I will follow with another quote, which is quite beautiful. To be entangled is not simply to be intertwined with another as in the joining of separate entities, but to lack an independent self-contained existence. Existence is not an individual affair. Individuals do not pre-exist their interactions, rather individuals emerge through and as part of their entangled intra-relating. Which is not to say that emergence happens once and for all as an event or as a process that takes place according to some external measure of space and of time, but rather that time and space, like matter and meaning, come into existence, are iteratively, re iteratively reconfigured through each intra-action, thereby making it impossible to differentiate in any absolute sense between creation and renewal, beginning and returning, continuity and discontinuity, here and there, past and future. Matter and meaning are not separate elements. They are inextricably fused together, and no event, no matter how energetic, can tear them asunder. Even atoms, whose very name, atomos, means indivisible or uncuttable can be broken apart. But matter and meaning cannot be dissociated, not by chemical processing or centrifuge or nuclear blast. And Barad connects this inseparability of matter and meaning to many, thi many things and many fields of knowledge production to feminist uh, theory, but also she's very concerned with the fields of science in particular, and she also, as she comes from physics, and she also speaks about how processes of observation and the specific materiality of the observing apparatuses in scientific experiments actually produce the observed objects with their respective properties. So she draws upon this indeterminacy principle of Niels Bohr and again, quantum physics. Um, but to, to leave that aside, I just want to remember this idea actually of inseparability. And think with it uh, for the arts as well and also for eco-social transformation, which actually I think it entangles many other fields and we have to speak about economy and we have to speak about culture, and we have to speak about everything together. Because inseparability is also actually what entanglement in the quantum physics world is all about. So it's not just a connection, however complicated it may be, a way in which two things that can still be seen, observed, and described as separate relate to each other. In quantum entanglement, particles are linked in a supercorrelation, as Barad further describes it, they literally become one and form one system, which can only be, only be described as one system. Um, and I wanted to show an image. This is actually from NASA. This is how they try to explain and to make accessible quantum entanglement. And they use this Einstein quote, this spooky action at a distance. I don't think it's, it's necessarily the, the best uh, um, yeah, the, the, the best um, help they, they can provide, but it's just to, to maybe to try to better visualize how two apparently distinct objects actually f keep functioning and they function as one. I will leave this on for a bit longer, but I also wanted to show, this image is also from NASA, 
and they, they, uh, they caption it as technology used to study the love between particles is also being used in research to improve communication between space and the Earth. I think it's nice that they use this metaphor of love to speak about quantum entanglement. It's quite, uh, quite cute <laughs> to say, um, to say the least. I will leave this on in case you want to go into Alice and Bob's uh, photons. But I will, I will try to, to continue. Um, so keeping in mind the idea of entanglement, not just as a more complicated um, interaction or connection between entities that one can still see as separate and can still describe as separate, so you could uh, still speak about one without the other but as an inseparability of mutually constituting agencies. I want to move further and also use some of my works to expand on the topic, but also to touch on the, for example, the inseparability of art practice, of artworks and art mediums, and of exhibition making of, or art making from questions of funding and access to resources, uh, the inseparability of discourse and symbolic meaning from the material constraints or the very infrastructure architecture of the design of the exhibition structure or the project structure, and from matters of cultural policy altogether, which in their turn cannot actually be separated from politics in general, from how we understand or how we think about public education, for example, if we still think about public education and from sensibility, subjectivation and society altogether, which in turn is entangled both with how we understand the planet and what to do while facing the challenges that we are facing and with the need for economic redistribution. We cannot have quality public education without economic redistribution and we cannot have good art without educated or good creative practices without educated and sensible practitioners audiences, and also audiences, sensible audiences to witness and actually create, co-create that good art and those interesting practices and so on. So I'm also interested in following entanglements a bit and extrapolating to the needed political, economical, cultural changes that seem to be fortunately or unfortunately also entangled or inseparable. And I want to, to um, to just go through some artworks, so to use a bit my practice to, to, to talk further about entanglements. Some that can be more strongly or other more loosely connected to this concept of entanglement in its more radical meaning. And I will start with an example of a work in public space, um, which might be interesting in relation to the very definition of public space as a negotiation between as a product of inseparable co-depending agencies and forces. And I, I wanted to quote Rosalind Deutsch's definition of public space, the social space where in the absence of a foundation, the meaning and unity of the social is negotiated, at once constituted and put at risk. And it is this sense of ongoing negotiation as the very meaning of the public in public space that I think I attempted to embody with a work called Tilted Arc. Uh, I'm just gonna, it's a video actually that I would like to play, so you need to bear with me for a bit. So Tilted Arc is the title of a public space work, which is, was seen, or I made it as a sculpture a little bit, and it takes the title actually after a Richard Serra sculpture. Richard Serra is kind of famous minimalist sculpture, works a lot with super heavy materials like steel, so the original artwork actually was a steel arc that cut across the square in Manhattan in the 80s. Um, so I basically remade Sarah's steel public space artwork uh, with performers, so in a completely different material, so to say, which I believe actually produced a completely different work. Maybe it's worth also saying, and again, I, I admire Sarah for, for many artworks, However, this uh, Tilted Arc work is seen as a kind of textbook example of failed public art projects. So 
um, a lot of people objected to it and it created a whole controversy. In the end, it was removed from the public square that it occupied in New York. It was, it was considered a very strong gesture. So basically, the steel arc cut across the square. It also blocked the view. I'm tired. I'm, I'm not showing um, an image of the original, but you can find it uh, online in many places. Uh, also, people felt like they were being very strongly choreographed in space, so they had to go around it. Um, and in the end, it was removed, and it's still in storage somewhere, so it was never installed somewhere else. Um, and, I, and I think just changing the material in a way, so I'm trying to produce the same gesture, but with live bodies and with uh, different human agencies, producing a completely different dynamic experience and choreography, so opening up this space for negotiation. Um, so I'm going to play a video. This is one of the few documentations of a work that I think also functions well as a video, so I will try to show it. Again, thinking of the public, of collective and individual agency as being negotiated or emerging through their encounters. It was made for a sculpture exhibition in Biel Bien in Switzerland, so very different context than New York altogether.
the documentation ends here, and these are just a couple of minutes. Uh, but it was a uh, work installed or performed for two hours every day for a week. So kind of becoming a bit permanent in that space and creating all sorts of, of situations. Um, I want to, to move to another work. Uh, uh, where is my <laughs> slideshow? <laughs> okay. Not this one, not this one, this one. Yes. Uh, I guess it's not very well visible, but I will try to, to, to um, describe it better. Um, this other artwork that I want to mention is called Signals, and it was made for the 9th Berlin Biennale. Um, and uh, I want to, to use it to touch upon the inseparable connections between or the entanglement of humans and technology, or the human and the technological and also the abstract and the concrete, also data points and the material bodies they stand in, in for. Uh, I want to show some images of it and also explain a bit how it functioned. Uh, so it was an ongoing action with live performers and a content ranking algorithm. So it had a live component and, and an online component. The online component was a pool of content uh, organized as a list of stories or headlines on a website so that people could access from anywhere, a website that was embedded on the Biennale's website. Um, um, and one could click on these stories if something caught your eye more than something else, so you could browse these stories. Uh, and you would click on that particular headline or story that drew your attention, and your click would be indexed by a content ranking algorithm, which would assign a weight to that click, so a rating of importance. This is what a weight means. Uh, based on many things, on, for example, how much time you spent on that website. So it would track your behavior on the website. How much time you spend there, uh, from which kind of device you interact with, and if it's Android, if it's uh, iOS, uh, from which location, um, and so on. And also, it would count what content gets more clicks. And based on those scores together, it would then construct a rating of relevance for the content. And the top 30 recognized to be most relevant stories would actually get to be materialized. So they would get to be embodied and performed in the exhibition space. And the exhibition space was a kind of a black box um, with a special light setup in which performers in motion capture suits would be embodying every day these ongoing uh, uh, top 30 most relevant stories to be performed. Um, they were wearing motion capture suits, but there was no digital capture actually taking place. Rather, I was interested in creating this double view, so creating also a little bit this machine view for the human, where if, people, if the performers would come very close to you, I, I'm not sure you can distinguish in the image on my right, uh, but when they, come cl they would come close, you would actually see the materiality of their bodies, and their bodies and faces would become concrete. When they would move further away from you, so with distance, they would disappear into abstractions of geometry of movement in space. The motion capture suits basically mean these black suits with reflective markers on them. Normally, a digital camera only sees the markers, so only sees points of movement in space. In this case, it was your eye that was supposed to function a bit like a camera. Um, so I, I was interested, let's say, in this play between abstraction and, 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 and the concrete, in between bodies and geometries of light in space, but also in this kind of strong and rather invisible correlation or entanglement between the online actions or the agencies of people clicking around these stories somewhere and marking this content as relevant or more interesting, and their materialization, so their um, embodiment in the exhibition space for someone else a lot of times to experience and to, in a way, bear the consequences. So I, I kind of thought about it as a metaphor between this invisible entanglement. And um, maybe it's worth mentioning that this was in 2016, uh, before the Trump election in the US, so before the whole Cambridge Analytica uh, issue. I don't know if you remember when the whole question of uh, how is something rated and how does something circulate on social media? What creates its relevance and for whom? And the whole question of algorithmic governmentality in a way kind of exploded into the mainstream. Um, and in the same vein, uh, I want to 
uh, also bring quickly two other works, uh, later works, Co Natural and Human Landscape, who also focus on the inseparability of our virtual and material bodies. And they involve both live performers and a so called hologram of a live material body. In reality, it's a Pepper's ghost projection, so more like a technical illusion. Um, and for whomever is interested, actually, I can explain later if you want to ask about the difference between the hologram and the Pepper's Ghost. I'm happy to do it. I'm also calling it a hologram because there are a lot of companies that produce these so-called holograms today. Um, and they're mostly used to resurrect dead celebrities. If you've heard about or if you've seen this Tupac Shakur appearance at Coachella years ago, and then Michael Jackson also gave a concert while, of course, he was already dead. Um, uh, Maria Callas, also Amy Winehouse, was said to be reanimated in this virtual form. So it's mostly about having these bodies or these images of these celebrities continue to perform even after death. Um, so I was interested with these works also in the very question of what is a body today, on how do our many bodies still remain entangled, or how they sit together and where does our body begin, and where or when does it end. Um, so in the entanglement of our biological body with its image and the many ways in which it is mediated and expanded today. And um, human landscape was also dealing with questions of capture and um, motion studies. Uh, Conatural also considered this increasing fragmentation of presence and self. Um, you know, that was also enabled, of course, by our digital milieu, but was also commenting, for example, on this idea of the self as distributed across time, space, different kind of bodies and organisms, also how we are make, made of many microbial others, um, different histories and different ways of remembering. I also want to quickly mention Aggregate, which is a large-scale work with around 60 to 80 performers who actually um, embody something like a time capsule. And the, insp the inspiration came from NASA's Golden Record project, uh, which contained the subjective selection of relevant information about life on Earth that was sent in space with the Voyager for a potential, to be potentially encountered by an alien species. So information about life on Earth uh, to be made available to alien species. And I want to mention it both because the choreographic material for it uh, includes a lot of references to vegetal, plant life, other animal and mineral life that human bodies and performers take on the task of incorporating and of shape, shape shifting into, from mangroves to tigers to crystals. So as a kind of homage and also a way of coming closer to otherness or to other other than human, more than human perspectives. So it works within a, an idea of codependency and entanglement between humans and more or other than humans in this sense. But also in the sense that um, it's not scripted. So each and anyone's choice is dependent on and is created also by the others. So there's no script, there's no narrative, but a set of possibilities. And the performers compose with each other in real time using existing material and minding some guidelines, but nevertheless composing in real time and making their own decisions within this framework. And decisions that are always influenced by others, that emphasize on both individual and collective presence, and constantly negotiate between the two, or let's say they see them emerge in relation to each other. And lastly, I want to mention also Encyclopedia of Relations, which is the work that Jazz made reference to, um, is now still on view within the international exhibition, art exhibition of this year's Venice Biennale. It's being performed every day for the full opening hours of the exhibition with groups of performers. It's now taking a short summer break, but continuing in September if anyone happens to go. And it works with the idea or rather the fact, I would say the fact that, again, everything is actually made of relations between, made of associations of elements that are in fact inseparable, and that relations constitute the very fabric of our world. To quote from the exhibition text, that they always link apparently distinct life forms or elements, revealing them as a constant flow of inseparable coexistences. And again, it takes inspiration from other life forms. For example, this is an image of 
an embodiment of pigeons billing. I don't know if you are familiar with this pigeon behavior, but actually they, they exchange food. But of course, I translated into something uh, slightly different. However, the weights of the performers somehow rely on each other. So um, it's nice to see it live. I'm, I'm, I try not to show too many videos. I somehow think they don't do justice to the actual live action. It's a, um, things are a little bit uh, harder to, to imagine, but in a way I think it's also good to miss on things. Um, um, but again, so it takes inspiration from other life forms and we embody relations, symbiotic, but also less fortunate ones, as seen in biology and botany, as well as more abstract ones, like between a body and its shadow, between musical tones or melodic lines. There's polyphonic singing, for example, in the work, rocks and waves and how they form a shoreline, humans and technology. Again, human labor and artificial intelligence systems, more specifically for this work. But here, um, uh, I think there is a way in which embodiment doesn't just try to represent another form. So we also do that. We try to experiment with the human body in something other than the usual anthropomorphic patterns of moving thinking. And we try to take another form to embody another perspective. But we also try to experiment with other dynamics. So with somehow becoming other, um, by um, moving thinking according to dynamics from the plant world, for example. Or in the case of the artificial intelligence reference, where the performers actually try to embody a neural network classifier, and they ask uh, visitors to label images for them. But to, to give an example from the plant life, here, for example, um, this is a, choreo a choreographed translation of the phenomenon of crown shyness, which actually sees trees, so trees from different species, different trees, sometimes different species also from the same species, um, managing to negotiate space and access to light so that their branches don't overshade, they never overlap, and they manage to grow around each other without touching. It forms this ca uh, canopy with these channel-like gaps, and we try to produce or to, to embody that same dynamic with human bodies. It doesn't look like a canopy. It looks more like a, you know, kind of maybe a vine movement on a wall, but we try to work with this, uh, yes, with the same dynamic of managing so beautifully in the in case of trees to, to perfectly negotiate uh, their livelihoods. Um, or here, for example, they also form something like a surrealist, exquisite corpse made of distinct elements, but that nevertheless function together as one. Um, or like here, they also emphasize between, um, on the relation between touch and memory, haptic memory, and they ask visitors to close their eyes and now experience the objects in the exhibition through touch. So the performers produce all sorts of haptic sensations for people with their eyes closed who only receive all of a sudden information through the sense of touch. Um, I'm going to skip maybe through this part. I don't want to make it very long. Um, to continue, I think when thinking about entanglements, uh, maybe one can also think about the way in which different mediums actually come together in one work. For example, bodies in space and dance can take on a sculptural aspect. And uh, in many, I think many times my works have been described as live sculptures. Um, I think there are many uh, movement works that also have a sculptural aspect. Uh, and I've been asked, where is my visual arts inspiration for that? Actually, the, my inspiration came from uh, dance. And this is, for example, an image from Václav Nijinsky's Afternoon of a Fawn. It's a dance work from early 20th century, uh, 1912, I think it was made in 1912. It's very sculptural, it's basically, it's like you see a painting or a sculpture moving on stage. So very early uh, work with, again, with the idea of sculpture and, and painting even, coming from the dance world, the ballet world, it was a kind of scandal because it was presented as a, as a ballet, which was also, which also was. Um, so, um, as three-dimensional objects, if you, they're not moving very fast all the time, so that they actually allow one to also focus on form and not only on dynamics, live bodies also have this capacity to foster associations with sculptures or, with sculpture or painting. So I'm also interested in setting the framework through which bodies, when observed, become sculptural. 
at the same time, of course, they also move and they speak and they sing and they breathe and they can also get tired. They do get tired, of course. Or they can become an image for a moment only to then break apart. So a work could also be described, let's say, as an entanglement um, between many mediums as a live musical sculpture painting, for example. Nevertheless, the work remains immaterial in the sense that it needs to rematerialize. It does not stay in one form permanent, permanently. And I think this is important because the medium of performance, which means that one needs to invest in the living and in live bodies. Uh, so the, the medium of performance as live work with live human bodies and not as documentation remains hard to include in visual arts contexts and their prevailing economy. And this, this links perhaps to the fact that politics in the art world in general, beyond exhibition content, always also lie elsewhere. And I think we should acknowledge the entanglement, the inseparability of the symbolic and the material, or of matter and meaning, again, to go back to Barad here as well. And we shouldn't speak about one aspect of an exhibition or a project without the other. And I think, unfortunately, we do, and we mostly speak of one, or at least in the arts, we speak a lot about the content and the discourse, the symbolic. So politics in the world of exhibition making and the arts is too often seen as pertaining to only this one aspect, an apparently distinct part of what is, in fact, an entanglement and one system. An artwork might have a very progressist content. Nevertheless, its medium, size, and aesthetics, for example, can make it function uh, you know, as a great luxury object, as a great asset for tax evasion and personal profit, when we know that art objects function a lot within uh, these networks. So can a sleek, large-scale monumental sculpture or a big oil painting be at the same time a conveyor of a progressive message and a luxury object that can decorate a private garden and can be circulated and recirculated on a speculative art market by big private commercial galleries that, for example, in the US came to have better art spaces than museums? And of course, following this intraactive lens and pathway, content and form emerge through their entangled intra-relating as well. So it is difficult to read any each one without the other. But precisely because of this, we also shouldn't discuss the arts only in terms of exhibition content or discourse, but also in terms of the architecture of their very institutions and projects. So just to give an example, what happens when the very exhibition design, and by design I don't mean the visual design, but the infrastructure, the structure of funding, for example, relies on private commercial galleries or private collectors to sustain the expenses of presenting an artwork? Doesn't that create a context where, even if the content of the work is different, artist representation is quite homogenous, in fact, in the sense that only artists with gallery representation and big gallery representation get to actually exhibit work. And isn't that entangled with the fact that in the end it is those already wealthy contexts and networks that continue to benefit, as big galleries continue to belong to particular wealthy, mostly Western European contexts, or US and so on. So what I am hinting at is the importance of acknowledging how questions of funding, where most of the money comes from for the exhibition or the project are, of course, inevitably entangled with the exhibition and its associated discourse. The two should be seen as one system. And even though many times obscured, this entanglement between private market-oriented commercial galleries or private collectors and the public institutional space that hosts the works and that creates, most often than not, a very different discourse around the exhibition and the artworks they show does actually matter. One can also observe it in the mediums being exhibited, mostly well-contained, easily tradable material objects. Less live works, less performance, even less video, more sculpture, painting, more of something graspable. And this is not to say that there is something intrinsically wrong with still material objects, definitely not, but it's just to acknowledge how particular mediums are also inevitably correlated to particular uses and meanings. And of course, we live in something worse than capitalism, but as that shouldn't be a paralyzing realization, neither should become a general excuse. 
And we should always also, not only but also, look at who sits on the board of our art institutions, who sponsors our exhibitions, and with how much. Which toxic or downright murderous businesses prospers because it gets serious tax cuts for supporting our now ecological art projects. So again, we shouldn't be paralyzed, but neither should we pretend these entanglements do not exist and have no consequences. And the weighting of consequences and compromises is actually key in understanding if it's worth making them or not. Also, questions related to labor, to fair wages, to what art contexts end up sustaining in the end, or not being able to sustain, and who are those who can sustain themselves in this art world, are inseparably connected and underlie, in fact, the claims the exhibitions and the artworks make on a discursive level. So to invest in the living and in a sustainable future and creative future, for me, at least from the point of view of the arts today, at this particular dire moment in time is to take into account and to tackle all these aspects together. Um, sustainability and ecological thinking today is also a matter of clear political choices. It matters who is asked to endure more austerity and bear the blunt of climate change. It matters who still gets to fly a private jet and who needs to cut their carbon footprint. It matters who owns the land, that we are invited to use for permaculture, who lobbies governments for particular decisions and in whose favor. So ecology is also entangled and it should be really discussed together with politics. So I want to end with a long list of inseparabilities and entanglements. Each of us is already many, also in biological terms. So not just in terms of gender, but and of course, there are not, each, not each of us is already many and there are differences. But in biological terms, you know, we have more bacterial cells than animal cells. This is a fact. We are, as Lynn Margulis describes, the human ebba rock edifice made, in fact, of many different and codependent life forms. We're also deeply enmeshed in an ever-evolving technosphere, which we shape and which shapes us in turn. So we're both part of the nature we try to observe and we change and the technical milieu which observes us and changes us in turn, and which was always part of human evolution. For those of us in the arts and in the creative practices, because now I think, you know, the, I think the concept of creative industries, which is there also always when we speak about creative, and that's, that's an, it has an interesting ambiguity. Um, but for those of us in the arts and the creative practices industries, and not only, in fact, I believe meaningful art practice is inseparable from sensibility and sensibilization. So the capacity to be and become sensible for both artist, audience, and producer or, or financing body alike. Which is in turn inseparable from quality education and the right to quality education for everyone. Which is in turn entangled with the capacity to then make informed decisions about the future at a scale and as democracies. And all these are inseparable from necessary large-scale economic redistribution as the only thing that can actually make that happen. Which is in turn entangled, for example, with policies of proper taxation or capping gas prices. Uh, policies of proper taxation also for the very wealthy, which is in turn entangled with the need to also recapture the state or what's left, left of the state for the left. And the chance of that functioning, when it happens, if it happens, is in turn entangled with the need to secure alliances in the same direction, which is in turn entangled with large-scale political action, which is in turn entangled with sensibility, empathy, but also will to fight and desire, which is in turn inseparable from the mobilization of all available tools, bodies, apparatuses, and structures for progressist ecological sustainable ends, which is in turn entangled to each of us and to all of us, who are in turn entangled with many other life forms. And I hope this is not read as a very evasive end, but perhaps as a map or a part of a map for entangled action for all that needs to be done and could be done together. Thank you.
I forgot to mention, I don't know what is the structure. If there are questions, I'm happy to be here or in the, should I be here? Okay. Anyone? Yep. To ask Spanish? Okay. Hiya. That was a really nice talk, thank you. Um, when you're talking about entanglement, it made me... Can you hear me? Just a bit louder. Sorry. It yeah, it brought, to, it brought to my mind the work of um, the anthropologist Tim Ingold, and the idea of enmeshment, which is quite a similar concept. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> I, I think it, do you, could you hear me when I speak? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then maybe just... I don't know if it's the direction of the speakers, perhaps. You can speak louder, I think. Okay, I'll, I'll try and speak louder. Now, is that better? They just, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about um, your use of the idea of entanglement and how that relates it, well, it, in my mind, it related to the work of the anthropologist uh, Tim Ingold and the idea of enmeshment, which is a, another word you're using, um, uh, which is a similar concept of the interrelatedness of, of, of the environment and reality. And in some ways, this is quite a complex idea, at least for me to understand, because it's sort of combinatorially explosive, it, it, in some way infinite. And one way he makes sense of it is through the idea of the line. Um, for example, a line of, of ants running up a tree where you have these individual entities but also this flow of information. Or maybe a, a path that's been worn by uh, humans over hundreds or thousands of years and in here you can work out a sort of relationship between, between life and the environment. And, and to me it gives a sort of direction and a, perhaps a teleology and it makes it conceptually understandable in some way. And I was wondering if that is something that, because I was looking at I was thinking when you showed this first video of this line of people and how that affected the behavior of everyone else and also when you're talking about people forming the canopy of trees and the sort of lines that form through there, I was wondering whether this was something you'd thought about in a way to conceptualize movement or if not, how you managed to make sense of this complexity of entanglement. Thank you for the question. Actually, no, I, ha I am also not familiar with the work of the anthropologist you mentioned, but I'm curious to write down the name and also didn't really think about, uh, about in entanglements in this way. To be honest, I think a lot of the connections with entanglements emerged again through work, so doing work that maybe not all the time was, um, the intention was not to work with entanglements, let's say. The intention was to do a, to produce something in the public space, and then this question of how things emerge in the public space and how agencies correlate um, just appeared with doing the work. Uh, it's true that the, the the idea of intra-acting agencies and how things are always distinct only in relation to another. I think it's it's very again it's very counterintuitive, and this is also the whole I think problem of quantum physics that it's it really. It fucks up your mind. I mean, you're not, you're not supposed to think in this way. I think the more Newtonian physics is the more traditional understanding of how the world works. So we have this and this we know. It has these properties already and we just realize it does. But not that this, we don't know what it is. And as we encounter it, actually it becomes what it becomes. But, but in a sense, I think what, we, what I take from it, um, whenever I try to, deep, to delve a bit deeper into it or when not, is just uh, this question, I think, of paying attention to how something else is always necessary to make up what we think is one thing or is a distinct thing. So it's a very straightforward, practical question at some point. And it, I think it was, um, it's helpful for everything from uh, you know, straightforward political action to poetics thinking that there's always, you always depend on something else. Even if it's, you know, sometimes it's about a couple relationship. And you think that you're doing everything, I mean, and then you realize, oh no, but actually I couldn't be doing this without the other. So I, I think it is really just a very straightforward, simple thing. That you actually, it, the, 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 the nature, everything around you kind of shows you this. And I think then it's just a matter of paying attention and actually being open to recognize and then, of course, this is also why I said and I brought at the end this question of will. Because I do believe in, in will and, and, and in intention. 
So just, we're not just kind of drifting around and something happens to us and we also influence something else, we don't know how. Of course, we, we have intention, but it's always influenced by so many things. Um, you know, I think even when you get excited about a left-wing politician winning an election, in my case, I think it's, it also helps you, for example, to tone down your expectations and to realize it's not going to all of a sudden, you know, 10 days that shook the world. It's not, things don't happen like that. It, they're a lot more circumstantial and a lot more connected to other things. And it's just, I think it's just about expanding your attention to account for all the myriad connections that we, uh, we depend on. Um, yeah, so I, I think I, this is how I approach actually this whole question of quantum entanglement. When you go into physics, and actually this book of Karen Barad, she's really, they're making the effort to, to make it accessible to a non-scientific audience. So, but it's still, at some point, it's what, how, I don't, I can't grasp that. So I think it's okay also to admit some limits within the actual um, meaning and force of, of the philosophy physics um, that we refer to, but I think we can also take some very practical insights. I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, more questions. Yeah. I have one. So, we used to have, a, as, as the SEMOS team here in Seville, a small office. And when the pandemic started, we had to stop uh, going because we couldn't pay the rent. So, as you can imagine, we went through unlimited number of video calls. Uh, and we started working uh, from home. And one day, a few months ago, uh, we were having a drink. Uh, in a bar, which is now the place we used to, to have meetings. And some of my colleagues said, we have to go back to the, to the street because when you go out, unexpected things happen. So I just wanted to ask you, when you were talking before about the, the public spaces as a place for negotiation, and every time we go outside, there is an unexpected and messy choreography and we have to do something. How uh, do you see that the public space has changed after the pandemic, and how do you see that as a choreographer and an artist? It's an interesting question. First, I just want to quickly say it. I don't know how to differentiate between the two, but when I mean public space, I somehow refer to the physical space. I think the online space is also kind of a maybe a fake public space, because it's so heavily protocoled, it's, you know, it, it's a property of something and someone we don't, I mean, uh, we can agree to that, but it behaves or it presents itself as a public space. Um, and that, that's also important to understand, I think, how we perform that and, and, and in there and what happens. With the street, um, I don't know, I mean, I think it also depends a lot on the context um, I, I come from Bucharest, I still live there in Romania. It's a place for cars, it's a city for cars. It's been um, after the 90s, so after the 1989 revolution and the fall of the communist regime in Romania. You know, in this transition to capitalism, I think, wait, there was no transition, we're still transitioning, <laughs> I think like kind of dreaming of something that is supposed to be attained that is nowhere else to be found also, the sort of welfare uh, <laughs> capitalism that we've been transitioning to. Um, but uh, the first thing that people did was buy cars. So it was a kind of a statement of, um, yeah, social status and power and also individualism. So it allowed you to move through the city however you like. It, and it became, you know, a city for cars and you can't really walk. It's very difficult. So actually, for example, in Bucharest, I don't feel like it sh things changed a lot because um, there wasn't much of a... Uh, street life, let's say. Whereas here even, you know, I've been here for a couple of hours actually, unfortunately. But you can notice there's a, you know, there's a different feeling of the public. Um, I've been now also for over a month in Italy, also of course there's a different feeling of the public. I think it depends a lot on the architecture um, and the, on the urban, urban design also. 
of particular cities. And of course, the cities that were designed and that are old enough to still think about the uh, physical public space as a space for meetings. And I think that that kind of translates well uh, also today. But I, yes, sometimes I also feel like nothing happened. Like I almost have the sense that these two years were not even there, which I think is actually bad. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, on one hand, I think, oh, uh, things kind of got back to normal, and then you remember the normal is actually, <laughs> you didn't want it, and it's not good, but then it's, um, yeah, there's this ambiguous feeling. I think this is, that there's an ambiguity, I think, uh, in the whole situation. I don't know if it changed. Maybe it didn't, and maybe that's also a bit of a problem. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, any some. other last question? Alguna pregunta más? No? Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much, Alexander. <laughs>